This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Kirby Anderson is the professor, author, and host of the Point of View radio show. His research with Probe Ministries reveals some startling revelations about the worldview of the church. Kirby, glad to have you with us today. Bob, good to be with you, and uh, thank you very much for letting me be a part of this. Hey, this is the kind of thing you do all the time. You're on the radio. <laughs> You're doing a daily radio show, right? Doing a daily radio show. We do a, a commentary, which they actually call Viewpoint, so we have the same kind of name there as well, mm -hmm. and uh, do a lot of radio and interviews. But lately, we've been doing a lot simply because of some of the surveys, but Pro Ministries is kind of a worldview apologetics ministry, and we've been around since 1973. I joined it in 1976, and so in a couple of years, we're going to come up on our 50th anniversary, wow. so it's been around for quite some time. You did the first Religious Views and Practices survey, and then uh, kind of followed that up again in, in 2020 with another survey and uh, some amazing things. Uh, take us through a little bit of that, uh, the, I, I guess the ideology behind it and the mechanics behind it and who you were talking to, and, and then we'll get into some of the findings. Well, one of the things we did um, more than 10 years ago was we recognized as a group that was speaking on college campuses, speaking in churches, and a number of other things, Bob, we were recognizing there was a real drop-off in the understanding of what you might call biblical truth and biblical orthodoxy. So we did surveys, interestingly enough, with a very significant number of individuals. These would be born-again millennials, primarily those born after 1980. Now, what we found at that time is, is that that you had a good percentage of individuals who actually did hold to a biblical worldview and attended church, but we saw very large portions of those who attended church that did not have a biblical worldview or even did not necessarily attend church. And these were just of people that were born again, people that had had a born again experience that was meaningful in their life that was still meaningful to them today. So 10 years later, we said, Probably we better to do an even larger survey, this one of more than 3,000 individuals, which would allow us to look at some other things like what was happening outside the church. Because we wanted to try to get our handle on what is happening with the uh, unaffiliated, sometimes referred to as the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Mm -hmm. That would be people that identify themselves as atheist, agnostic, or no preference. So we were able to not only see what was happening inside the church, but what was happening outside the church church because we are convinced that there are some very dramatic things that are happening. And if you are a Christian leader or a pastor, even a parent, you need to be really concerned about some of the things we're going to be talking about today. And the, the demographics of that, the age demographics, uh, did you have a targeted, targeted audience or was it just a br broad demographic? Again, that's a good point because our earlier run was, again, for the what you might call Generation Y, the mm -hmm. millennial generation. Right. This one was 18 to basically 55, so this would okay. include mostly the Generation Y, which are called the millennial generation, and now Generation Z, uh, which sometimes are called the iGen generation. And it helped us understand that there is a significant difference. And, and all of these people, do they identify as being born again? Well, that's the thing. In the first one, we only took uh, questions of born again. So this allowed us to look at both Christians and non-Christians. What you will find very quickly is that uh, the differences that you would hope would be between those who go to church and those outside the church isn't as much as you might think. And I think it illustrates something I know we'll be talking about a little bit later in one of our interviews, and that is the influence of social media, the influence mm -hmm. of pressure, and the influence even of public education. Did, what surprised you most, the, the, the depth of the de decline or the speed of the change? I think the biggest uh, concern, let's talk about those outside the church for just mm -hmm. a minute, was we went from a time in which you had maybe about 13% that could fit into the category of nuns or the unaffiliated, whatever phrase you want to use for them, mm -hmm. to almost tripling that number now. So the fastest growing demographic group right now for the Generation Y or Generation Z, the millennial generation of those following, are those individuals, interestingly enough, who are simply saying they're not interested in religion. They're not interested in Christianity. They're not interested 
interested in anything else. Because we can divide this up into born-again Protestants, other Protestants, Catholics, other religions, atheists. And what we find is the fastest growing demographic group are those individuals that simply don't have an interest in religion. Now, here's something else we found, which I think proves a point that sometimes we've adopted a myth about this. And the myth that some of the Christian leaders have, Bob, is that, well, yeah, they leave the church for a while, but eventually when they get married, they have come kids, they come back to church again. You've heard that so many yes, times. Yes, we have, yeah. And I call that the field of dreams myth. Field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. We built 350,000 churches in America. They're not coming. They're not coming. We've been able to identify not only are they not coming back to church, um, but others that were in the church are leaving. And yeah. the idea of coming back is assuming that they were in church in the first place. My story is I'm broadcasting today from Dallas. We have a Dallas Art Institute. One of my friends works there, and when they will take some of the students into art galleries, they will also teach them architecture, so they'll take them into various architectural structures, including a church. Bob, when half of those kids walk into the church, they say to the fa faculty member, this is the first time I've ever been inside a church. So this idea that they're going to come back again, no, we can't expect them to come to us. If you're a pastor, an elder, a deacon, a church leader, you need to go to them. You need to find ways to reach out. Well, did it surprise you when, when last year, uh, uh, I guess mid-2021, church is opening back up again after the pandemic and, and uh, the, uh, the attendance was way off, pastors expecting it to come back up, and in a lot of cases, it just leveled off and never came back up. Well, people watching, I don't know, watching church services on live stream, whatever they were doing, their lifestyle seems to have changed to where church didn't become, I mean, it didn't return to be a part of it. Yes. And that's part of the issue because this is a generation that's used to using these kinds of things, little yeah. uh, mm -hmm. phones and things of that nature. So there is a sense in which some of them are still connected digitally, but there also is a real need to talk about the fact that it talks about in the book of Hebrews that we should not neglect a gathering together. Mm -hmm. The churches involve accountability, encouragement, and ministry. So there has been a tendency for those individuals that got used to attending church in their pajamas or just occasionally attending church to uh, continue that process. And so it illustrates, again, the need for churches, pastors, Christian organizations to really talk about the importance of church attendance because we are not seeing the return back. And I, as a matter of fact, had an article came out in uh, Christian uh, Today, Christianity Today, that was really focusing on this whole idea of the fact that they're not coming back again. It's back to what I call that uh, a field of dreams myth. If you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. No, there's a lot that aren't coming. We're going to have to figure out ways to yeah. go to those. Even those individuals who used to be church members are Christians, but aren't necessarily coming back into the doors of the church. Well, and, and all of the the, uh, the information you got back, what, what was the most alarming to you? Was it the, the lack of a Christian worldview uh, or the change? In, uh, I mean, you have a born-again Christian who had a world Christian worldview and has now been uh, culturally kidnapped by national media to have a, a, almost a non-Christian worldview. What, what alarmed you the most when you looked at these, these stats? One of the things that now we'll talk about inside the church, and again, we were talking about individuals that said... Um, either verbally or mm -hmm. in our surveys, that they had a born-again experience in the past, believed that they were saved by grace. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they believed they were saved by Jesus Christ. But we found that nearly two-thirds of those individuals, more um, in the 20-something than in the 40-something, but nearly two-thirds of them agreed with this statement, Bob. I believe that an individual can be saved by belief in Jesus, Buddha, or Muhammad. Now, they were supposed to disagree with that statement, and what you find is, is nearly two-thirds of them, the range is a little different depending on which age group, but nearly two-thirds of those individuals believe that they can accept that statement, and it's the issue of pluralism. Because if indeed you believe that people can be saved apart from Jesus Christ, and you understand why they might feel that way, they have friends, neighbors, co-workers, yeah. class that are not Christians, and they say, well, I, I got to believe God would 
grade on the curve and allow those individuals, you can see how important it's going to be to really, inside the churches, talk about such things as John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And that also then leads to one of the other surveys, because we found that this generation, these two generations, the younger emerging generation, they're not really involved very much in evangelism. Mm-hmm. They're not sharing their faith with their friends and their coworkers and their classmates. Well, if you're believing that people can be saved apart from Jesus, you can see yeah. that that really kind of cut the nerve, cut the motivation, the impetus to go out and share your faith. So, if again, if you're concerned about reaching this country, reaching the world for Christ, you can see that if you aren't necessarily convinced that the good news of the gospel needs to be spread around the world, you can also see the impact that would have church missions and foreign missions, and all sorts of other activities as well. You think that that, that view, um, I mean, say you take these back, people back 10 years ago, would they, would they have had the same answer, do you believe? Uh, or this, their, their view has changed or these are just different people? What we found, interestingly enough, and again, this is more historical because I can't give you statistical mm-hmm. stuff, but I can give you lots of articles yeah. that have been written. You know, after World War II, there was kind of a decline in evangelism, but very quickly you had a couple of things. You had Billy Graham coming on the scene. Right had Campus Crusade for Christ, now called Crew. You had the so-called Jesus Movement. We've talked with uh, Greg Laurie and others Mm -hmm. writing books about this. And so really, by the time you got into the 1960s and 70s, this was a time of really almost unprecedented evangelism in America. But you can see that the trajectory is now downward once again, because if you are convinced that people are saved apart from the gospel, then you can see that your emphasis on evangelism is probably going to be a lot less. What, what about Bible literacy itself? Did you did you ask any questions about back then? How many of them were actually reading the Bible, studying the Bible, and then today are they relying on the Bible at all? Do they are they Bible illiterate? Have they have they just set it aside and don't even own one? Yes, and I have an article that came out in the February issue of Decision Magazine based on that issue of Bible literacy because. We then asked them, what did they know about certain things? And Bob, what was interesting, on the big issues, uh, most individuals, even non-Christians, have a pretty good idea of who God is, although sometimes they have some pretty crazy ideas. Jesus Christ falls off a little bit. Uh, the belief that the Bible, you know, that one drops off. But the real drop off comes when you start asking questions about, is the Bible true at all times in all places? In other words, this idea of moral absolutes, mm-hmm. that's where it drops off very, very quickly because they really don't believe, this younger generation doesn't believe in moral absolutes. Mm-hmm. They believe you have your view of truth and I have my view of truth and someone else has a different view of truth called postmodernism. They also have a view of of relativism. You have your view of ethics. I have my view of ethics. Someone else has a different view of ethics. So you, you can very quickly begin to understand that these are individuals who actually maybe know a little bit about the Bible, but they don't have a level of Bible literacy that was assumed to actually be part of, say, the builder generation or even the boomer generation. And as a result, that's another real concern and a need for us to once again teach the Bible. I've oftentimes said that maybe pastors ought to think about doing a series called The Essential Gospel because, you know, you have a football game. You know, right now they'll be playing football, but what do they just have in the summer? Well, they had spring training. And I think it's about time to have spring training again, get back to the basics, because this is going to be really important if we're going to grow churches in the 21st century. You can find out more about Probe Ministries and Kirby's radio show at these websites. After the break. But when it came to the box of Down syndrome, uh, I grew up with an aunt that had Downs, and and so I, I just simply couldn't leave that box unchecked. That's coming up next on Viewpoint. Would you like to help expand the reach of Viewpoint with Bob Lacey? Then sign in with your YouTube account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now would do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places that missionaries can't even reach. Thank you for helping us reach the world by sharing Viewpoint with Bob Lacey. This is where, on other programs, you'd be watching a commercial, but not on Viewpoint. 
If you've never supported TV44 before and enjoy Bob's interviews on Viewpoint, we encourage you to please support us today. Go to WTLW.com and click Donate. It's easy for Christians to focus on the big issues like racism, pro-life, or education, but the Bible says when you help the least of these, there's a big blessing. Special needs adoption is something close to the heart of my guest today. Your wife had some, uh, I wouldn't call them visions, but she, God planted <laughs> in her heart early in, in life that she was going to have a big family. She did, uh, or, or I should say he did. Yeah. Uh, she has always, or had always thought that she would have 13 children. Whoa. Did she 13. tell you that before you were married? Uh, she did, yes. <laughs> well, okay, so, uh, uh, okay, yeah. so you were for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's amazing that God placed the adoption thing in her heart because uh, how long did you, you, you folks tried yourselves? We did. After you got married. We did. Uh, to get pregnant. What, what yeah. was that story like for well, her especially? Right, we got married in 02 and, and we worked for about five years to have our own children. Mm -hmm. And that was unsuccessful. Uh, we did some infertility treatments and then realized that we would rather pour uh, the time and money mm -hmm. into adoption rather than that. Yeah. that. That was just our own personal feeling. And so we began the process and we were uh, approved to begin searching. And two weeks later, our oldest son uh, came. He was about three and a half or so. Now, what makes that so, unusual is it, was, it happened so quick, but the right. reason probably is it was, a, it was a special needs adoption. Right. Right. He, he came out of a good bit of trauma mm -hmm. and he's on the autistic spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it, it happened very, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's his name? His name is Bryson. And so he's your oldest. He, yes. How old, old is he now? He's 18. Yeah. When I first saw your yeah. story, it was in a, a, a newspaper that we get at home called the Epoch Times. And it, uh, one is on Amish values, but the other story is on, uh, is on your whole adoption situation. And that's, there, there's, uh, there's five kids there. So you're, you're almost to 13, but you've you got, you got a ways to go. But if I you hope we're read, done. If anybody wants to read that story, it's in the July 28th through August 3rd uh, issue of uh, Epoch yeah. Times. And you can get that, you can see that online too. Had he been in the foster care system or had he he'd been with one family? No, he, he, was, he was actually adopted previously and then disrupted where uh -huh. where that family basically said i think we're done here and they gave them back we can't handle it yeah they gave them back to the adoption agency did you know that before you adopted we did yeah and we you did. thought well they couldn't handle it but god's going to give us some kind of grace <laughs> going to give us some kind of grace here that uh yeah so this first couple of years a little it was a little bumpy mm -hmm. yeah it was a little bumpy but then but it was good god revealed to lisa again that hey Get ready. Yeah, we that in inside the adoption process, when you go through the paperwork, you have mm -hmm. to. Uh, that there's an element of playing God. I mean, it 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 feels kind of funny, mm -hmm. but you you have to check boxes of I would take this or I would take that because you're picking and choosing who my kids are going to be. Right. It it's a it's a goofy feeling, mm -hmm. and and we really had to pray through that. But when it came to the box of Down syndrome, uh, I grew up with an aunt that had Down's. And, and so I, I just simply couldn't leave that box yeah. unchecked. Uh, and so, you know, Lisa, very graciously, uh, she, she had no experience with, with uh -huh. Down syndrome but herself. But you had grown up that way because your, your dad's sister right. had Downs. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so we checked that box. And so uh, they, that whole process came together and we were matched with our daughter. Uh, and, and, and she was born the, the, uh, the very following morning after we met the birth family. So, really? Yeah, she was born in a hurry. Uh, we were thrown into parenting just Ooh. like that. You know, and, yeah. and it, you know, ironically, uh, yeah. you know, Bryson with our three and a half year old son, uh, that went from this cooing little baby to, uh, you know, a little guy that can fight back. So yeah, it, yeah, it was different, but. What, what's your prayer life like at that time? <laughs> I mean, does it, does it change from? I mean, does it change from prior to the adoption, and all of a sudden you're in the midst of it? You're in the weeds now. We were what, in the what, weeds. What, what's, yeah. your, what's your prayer life? We <laughs> prayed a lot. <laughs> we did. But yeah. what kind of what kind of uh, pleas were you making to God at that time? Uh, 
help us get through everything and, and just and just help us to you know to learn and to uh, be able to understand you know what the children need and, and things like that it wasn't like yeah. i can't take any more of this no uh, change these situations <laughs> it was help me live through that situation right walk, walk through it right because god promises you'll walk through those right. things with us it didn't quit it didn't stop there we kind of thought we were done you know at the time because we mm -hmm. had our hands full then as as we as we moved on um, we we felt that it was time, you know, to mm -hmm. you know to add another uh, another you felt child. It was time. Well, now, did not. You, you, were you still thinking special needs? You think by now we yeah. want a child that's maybe doesn't have any specific needs? And we we had seen the need uh, inside the special needs world. Okay. And so we just Lisa and I both just really knew, and and I don't say knew as in as as a cocky thing, but, mm -hmm. but we just had a sense that, the, that our children would have a special need of some sort. And that because, God had prepared you for this. Right. Unknowingly or unknowingly, as, uh, you, you, you knew that you were probably better equipped than, than a lot of people to be able to do I, this. I don't know that we yeah, thought yeah. that, you know, but, but we just had a sense that that's what yeah. was gonna happen, yeah. We were on the chopping block in, in, you know, in that one or two final decision uh, families for mm -hmm. about 25 children. Uh, All and so, needs? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that's what I'm telling you is yeah. the need for adoptive families that, that will say yes to children with special needs mm -hmm. is just immense. It really is. And so we were then matched with our son, uh, Bennett, and he was born in Florida, and we were able to, uh, to bring him home. Yeah, it was good. But that's something I'm not sure people realize that you, you get matched with a with a birth family. The, mm -hmm. the the child's not born yet. Right. You've got to do a lot of traveling. You've got to right. at that point in time you take on the cost of of, of the because again he's yeah. he had he had Downs right. Yeah, he did. He was born uh, with Down syndrome. Um, you know, kids with Downs will often have one of one of uh, three challenges. Uh, Down syndrome. Uh, you know, will often have issues with the heart or, you know, perhaps lungs or sometimes uh, uh, the digestion. Okay. And so, uh, that? yeah, I, you know, be, uh, little Benny's mm -hmm. issues were, were with his breathing. And so he was in the hospital for about a month. So the, the time frame between Adelaide and Bennett was? Uh, about three years. Three years. Yeah, about three years. Did you think you're done at that point? <laughs> yes, we did. That's exactly where we were. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa began to think and pray about China. And I, I, you know, we, she even put a little, you know, a little guy's uh, picture on the fridge and started talking and, you know, kind of thinking through everything. And, and I made the comment that, you know, I'll go to China if I have to. I mean, if, if the Lord wants us to go to China to bring home a little guy with Down syndrome, that's, you know, that's fine. But it'd be really great if he just yeah. bring him to our door. Now, would, it, would he survive in China if he had Down syndrome? Uh, they, that's a that's a hard question to answer. A lot of them don't mm -hmm. because they don't get the care. Uh, they they oftentimes they'll age well, out. They and, do they go as far as the birth even? Well, oftentimes I mean, not. you talk about China, so yeah. Oftentimes they get something we really don't know, but yeah, they. So, but it wasn't a China. It didn't turn out to be a Chinese no, adoption, did it? No, it didn't. <laughs> Just a what, what? What? What did you <laughs> said? I mean, there's there's something in, in I don't know whether I read it in your in, in your notes before the interview or in the paper that. Yeah. If, if God's going to do this, he's got to bring him to the door. Yep. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. That's exactly what I said. So yeah. what happened? Well, about two weeks later, we got a phone call uh, from our adoption agency from years past. And, and like I said, the, you know, the home study was gone. Mm -hmm. it, would, it had expired and everything. And the home study would change anyway. Now you have three kids. Right. And, and, exactly. Yeah. So she calls us up and says, hey, there's a local family. Uh, you, you know, about an hour away, you know, but, mm -hmm. yeah. And they just had a baby with Down syndrome and they are, they are just, they have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And because of our family, uh, many times in our own community, people will call me and, and, and just tell us when there's another baby born with Down syndrome in, in the home community. Mm -hmm. And so we get to be able to go encourage and, and, and tell Talk them what a wonderful thing. Them. Yeah, exactly. Keep your head above water a little right. bit. Yeah. Because they are not expecting it. You know, it's it's an it's mm -hmm. it's it's a different a uh, scenario. It is. It's, it's a, a shock. shock. Yeah. And so Lisa and I will often take our family 
and just you know just just really try to encourage them and mm -hmm. tell them you don't know how wonderful this is going to be it's such a you know it's such That's a fantastic a blessing in itself just to encourage these families it's it's a real joy mm -hmm. and so we thought that's exactly what we were doing mm -hmm. you know with this uh, family and they ended up and 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 asked us to to care for him for you know for a weekend to give them a bit of a break okay. and at the end of that time they said hey we would like to know if you if you would adopt him and so, yeah, did they, they brought them to did our they door. Have, did they, was that their only child? No, no, was they they, okay. they actually have a, a son and a daughter as well. Okay, and they just yeah. thought that they they would be underwater with with this with this child. It, I think it was I think it was a lot of fear of the unknown yeah. with Down syndrome. So how um, do you how do you arrange an adoption like that with a family that says, <laughs> "Will you please adopt our child?" And it it was a very quick. Uh, I I think Lisa and the agency did it in about two weeks, which is unheard oh, of. Right. Which is unheard yeah. of. Yeah, that is crazy. But it worked out it, beautifully. And, and his name? His name is Miles. So how are they all doing yeah. now? I mean, this has been. Uh, Miles is how old? He's four. So he's four years plus sixteen. Yeah, you've been doing this for a while. Yeah. So uh, how how are they all doing? They're doing great. They're 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 really doing well. Um, we we actually have moved Bryson into uh, into a group home setting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for he's the oldest. He's yeah. the oldest, right? He's eighteen, and so he he lives, uh, you know, with other folks that can take uh, that can take great care of him, and he is one happy camper. There, he yeah. he just loves it. And how often so, do you see him? I mean, we talk quite a bit, mm -hmm. uh, and and I think we're going to see him tomorrow night, actually. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so yeah, he's doing well. To, he the, is. The other four. The uh, the other three are <laughs> doing fantastic. Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. Uh, they're they're doing great. Uh, we we homeschool them. Uh, you know, obviously Lisa was a teacher, and so sure. it's a it's a real thing. It's now you good. went through. I mean, there's, there's some job changes in there for you. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But yeah, what did this actually? What, what have you seen that it's done to you and Lisa in that in that? <laughs> what is it? Twenty years now, almost. Yeah, so. yeah, we're married for twenty years. Yeah. So what is yeah. it? Uh, you're not the same people currently. Oh my, no, we are. We're probably more messed up than we were twenty. <laughs> That's your well or put to take care of some kids. It's it's yeah. It's yeah. been a joy. It's yeah. it, it's been a real joy. So have you have you ever sat down to the two of you and just said, "Here was our life when we got married. This is our, this is what we th our hopes and dreams." Yeah. Now where are we? Do you ever kind of review that stage of life with each other? We do that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think it's I think it's good. I think it's healthy for us because uh, it, it's it's our life is just intense mm -hmm. and. Uh, we don't get many breaks, you know. We, uh, well, you, Lisa yeah. does not, you know. She's she's at home with the children, uh, pretty much all the time. Mm -hmm. So you know, our our moms do try to help, uh, but but you know, babysitting for children such as ours is not a, it's not an easy thing. Yeah, yeah, it's not someone you yeah. used to call some fourteen year old and say, "Hey, come on after the that's, football game." And that's baby. exactly yeah. right. So yeah. how can somebody see your story? So um, oh boy, if they want to, if they want to. Read more about your you and Lisa's story. Yeah, I know you can go online and, and probably get to the. Uh, I don't know if you can get back to the July, uh, twenty twenty one issue of Epoch Times, but if you right. do, the story is there. Plus another great story we're going to talk about a little later on. Yeah. Later on, but is there any way to get to your story? They could probably just find us on at um, at plainvalues.com. Plainvalues.com. Yeah. It's our hope that Viewpoint encourages you to have the faith and knowledge to live an authentic life for Christ. As we do each week, I remind you that this show and the ministries of TV44 are supported by viewers just like you. So we'd appreciate your financial support. I'm Bob Placey. Thanks for joining me.